right. So it, 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 first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for putting together this amazing conference. I don't know what you guys think, but this I, I really love this format and just learning so much and having it distilled. So we'll do our best to do that here, too. Um, and I just also want to give a little disclaimer. Um, as some of you know, I'm on partial leave from Stanford at the Department of Justice, but I'm here today with my Stanford hat on and this presentation doesn't reflect the view of any institution or government. Okay. So I want to, and today I want to talk about regulation um, in, and marketplaces as they fit together. Um, I'm going to start out uh, by talking about some general themes we know from regulation of firms. And then I'm going to talk about regulation inside marketplaces, communities, and tech firms. And one of the reasons I want to draw these analogies is that we are really facing some quite challenging regulatory problems right now and you know the technology developments in the last you know six months to a year i think have just accentuated that point that we have technologies out there that and, and that are having a really big impact and we don't really know how to regulate them very well and, and so one place to draw inspiration when you're facing difficult problems is to understand how you govern things when you have a little more control and then you can perhaps draw inspiration for design in situations where you're regulating more at arm's length. So that's kind of going to be a theme of my presentation. So just to start, um, let's think about like high level, what are some of the traditional themes we think about when regulating firms? And we can think about there's sort of a couple different kinds of actors that regulate firms, could be governments, but there's also a lot of non-government organizations that play an important role, including people like us who write exposés and do research and show the impact of things that firms are doing. Um, and many of you in this audience have had big impacts on industries through research that you've done. But journalists, consumer advocates, social media, all of these things also can shape things. And actually, I was just chatting with, with Jim about how this conference is a good research enabler. We all benefit from research enablers like data sets. And you know, these um, external actors can also enable the disciplining of firms by creating data sets, by creating research, by creating ways to measure, as well as by making things salient to consumers and firms and shaping their incentives. So I think in the space we're living in today, the, the re regulatory environment really needs to be inclusive of all of that, um, especially if we're thinking about digital firms, technology firms, and so on. Um, those can play a really important role. Um, so, you know, there are some really basic themes from Regulation 101 that, you know, why do you have regulation instead of markets? We all kind of know the, the laundry list. Um, some of the things that I think are, have been particularly important in the technology space and in the last, you know, 15 to 20 years or 30 years are that we're seeing um, a lot more importance of barriers to entry and scale economies. And we're also seeing barriers to entry created in more novel and complex ways. And I think Michael will talk about um, some of these things in, in more detail. But you know, when you have multi-product firms, one firm, one product can have a big impact on how consumers make decisions for other products. And that wasn't the that wasn't the majority of, of the regulatory problems we had in the economy 30 years ago. And it's taken some time for us to catch up to how to think about the relationship among multi-product firms. Another common theme when you, so in a regulation course, you start with all the reasons you need regulation, and then you go to all the ways that regulation can be bad. Um, some of the things that I think are, are particularly important in the modern economy uh, to consider are things like regulatory capture and ways in which regulation can increase barriers to entry. Um, so for example, you can have privacy regulation that privileges data sharing inside a firm against data sharing outside a firm, but that then gives a big competitive advantage to a firm that owns 100 products against single product firms. Um, and in addition, we can see a lot of influence of, of large firms in writing those regulations in a way that create barriers to entry. And this has been a theme in regulation courses for decades. Um, this is in the textbooks, um, you know, regulatory capture, but it's it continues to be an issue. And then, of course, then there's lots of tools we can think about that have design elements in them 
to remedy those problems. So like in the financial services sector, a lot of countries around the world have created sandboxes where smaller firms can operate in, in, in either if they're doing something that wasn't clearly covered by previous regulation or the regulatory burdens might be higher. So we can think about a regulatory scheme from a broader perspective where that scheme is going to have a really big impact on who enters and who competes and then their design components of how big do you have to be and what what leads you to graduate you know into a more um, rigorous regulatory regime we also have seen size restrictions in proposed and enacted legislation in um, regulating digital markets so these types of regulations can be pretty hard to write and pretty hard to design and they can have unintended consequences um, especially like you know you could have a big firm that's a small player in a particular market and so on. So, so these are really tricky things to write. Another theme that I think is, is really getting elevated in digital markets, but has also been around for a long time, are that they can be breakdowns in consumer choice. So information may not be available to consumers or only available at high cost, so there can be a lot of free riding. If you think about things like privacy and security, it's a lot of effort to figure out whether a firm is actually keeping your data secure or not. Um, and you have free riding. Now, again, some of these third party organizations can help with that. They can shape the market by gathering information and then putting clear, easy to understand labels on things so that consumers can make choices. But one of the big challenges we've seen, so having the right information is necessary, but not sufficient for consumer choice. And in a lot of issues, there's been a, a couple of decades of research now showing that you know, consumer choices and even comprehension of things related to concepts like privacy are, 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 are challenging and that even giving people information clearly is not probably not sufficient to get the outcomes you want. There are also certain market structures where competition doesn't work very well. So there's a QJE paper by Edelman and Wright in 2015 about credit cards showing that an increase in competition can lead to an increase in prices. And one of the things that leads to that dynamic is that consumers are making the choice of which card to use, um, but the credit, the credit cards are not, uh, by contractual provision, cannot charge more to the consumer for using a more expensive credit card, and the credit card companies have aggregated so many consumers that the merchants feel like they have to take them. So you don't, you don't, and then if you get increased competition, you can end up with competition for rewards for, for bribing consumers to come to you, which then get passed on as higher merchant fees. And so that's how more competition can lead to higher prices. Um, and, and it's basically an agency problem, you know, wh where the person making the choice decision doesn't actually see the price directly. And that can have all sorts of, um, of problems from distribution because poor cash paying consumers pay higher prices and rich people get subsidized with their cash back credit cards. So this, this is something that's been, this is, you know, if you haven't read this literature, it's, this is like a multi-decade literature. This is well, very well established. And there's been a lot of regulation around that, but this is an example where competition just isn't really gonna work. So when debit cards got more popular, they just regulated the fees. And so, because they, they knew that competition wasn't gonna get you there, um, but then the, the it, things popped back up again in nonlinear pricing. So we have a lot of complications in trying to design schemes and environments where consumer, there's something interfering with consumer choice. Another example is behavioral consumers, um, like who, who might not anticipate add-on fees. And there's also good IO as well as behavioral literature on add-on fees and, and junk fees have been a theme of in, in, the, in the Biden administration. Uh, finally, um, we can think about them, what are the design questions and how do you shape these markets in the environment in environments where these are problems well we can try to solve public good and free rider problems on information um recently some of those of you who were on twitter people were trying to coordinate everybody to go over to mastodon and like that was a hard thing to do you know there can be coordination problems of moving between new platforms even if everybody would like to move um another design theme which i think has a lot of possibility is regulating inputs versus regulating outputs and I'm going to give some examples of that, and I think that's also going to come up in, in some of the other people's comments as well. So an example that's had some interesting empirical work 
um, like Chiara Ferranato and, and co-authors have studied uh, comparing occupational licensing um, versus monitoring and reputation. So in the old world, we would try to keep people um, safe by making training people and having people jump over hurdles before they start. In the new world, we can monitor them. So how do you mix inputs and outputs to solve hard regulation problems? And finally, um, we have to be aware that another participant in the regulation of firms is actually the adjacent products. So if you think about an e-commerce platform, it is essentially regulating the e-commerce businesses that live on them um, or um, communities. I'm going to go into that in more detail. But just as the big theme that, that some firms are regulating other firms in a way that affects the industry structure in the adjacent industry. And in a digital world, there's so many ways this can happen now. It's like tools that help you compare prices, tools that help you switch between platforms, um, tools that steer you in one way or the other. Um, there's a lot of these, uh, these tools. I have a paper last here with Fiona Scott Morton that outlines some of the um, competition implications of these tools. Um, but for the purposes of, of this discussion, I think when you're thinking about regulation, it's like we used to have this very narrow set of levers, but now we have a much broader set of levers. And so thinking outside the box in terms of enabling products that shape markets in good ways or in bad ways um, is, is important thing to bring into the problem. And I should say for those of you who aren't that into the platforms literature, although it is a very mature literature in some ways, there are tons of unanswered questions. So like the theory of platform design has many more unanswered questions and answered questions. Most of the papers still make so many simplifying assumptions, they leave out all the interesting stuff. So like I have a paper in management science that tries to generalize and we spent years trying to figure out the algebra if I was only Jean Tirol, I probably would have got <laughs> done it better and faster. Um, but there's still room for people to find elegant models that actually allow you to tractably incorporate the things that really matter. And shifting consumers around, controlling their behavior, controlling their information, changing their search costs, those are really important factors. Okay, regulation within firms. So everybody here is probably pretty familiar with contract theory. Inside of firms, we have multi-layer agency problems. Boards are trying to get CEOs to do stuff. CEOs are trying to get middle managers to do stuff. Middle managers are trying to get workers to do stuff. And they have a set of tools that they use, financial objectives, qualitative information. I'm going to use the term KPI to keep my slide short. That's a, a key performance index. That's just another word for a measure or an outcome a metric. Um, we have lots of theory, and I don't know if Paul's still here, so I'm going to keep referring to Paul through this talk because I, I've been thinking about him a lot through all of my uh, understanding of in the real world of what's going on. Um, we have really big multitask problems. And one of the themes that's super important inside a firm is that the things you can measure are short term and they're narrow, and the things you care about are long term and broad. And so what Paul and Bing taught us like in 1991 is that if you have that kind of problem, then you have things you do, like you dampen incentives um, for short-term things because you're worried about long-term things. You change the design of jobs um, to restrict what people can do. And I think they opened up the problem. This is just a very intractable problem. And so you need to think outside the box. You may not be able to solve it with a contract. You need to solve it in other ways. And so this problem of like the world, a much more data-driven world is going to measure the wrong things has massive implications. I would say, I'll, I'll try to flesh this out, but I mean, if you think about why does, you know, YouTube radicalize people or why does, you know, why does these algorithms end up getting people like to, you know, into fringe, uh, into fringe things, a lot of it is about, you know, engineers maximizing clicks and in a naive way and, and, and having no way to measure or not, a, or not a good way to measure the overall implications. And of course, it can be bad for the, plot, for the firm itself to do that, but they're solving themselves a second best problem. So one frame for a firm is that it is a second best problem. It cannot itself govern the things that it cares about, let alone the things that we care about. It has a hard time doing that because it has a hard time measuring them. 
Now that says one really important thing that we all have to do right now is figure out how to measure what we care about. In the world of AI, we don't have the right conceptual framework. We don't even have, like you say, oh, don't be biased. You know, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, turn that concept into a, a formula, let alone put numbers in the formula. You know, that's the research that has to get done. And it's, it's not done. I mean, there's been progress, there's hundreds of papers, but it's, a, it's, if you dig into it, you'll find it's an unsolvable problem. It's a, and so we're going to be having second and third best solutions, which means that this is a research agenda for the next, you know, 30 years. It won't be finished in one equation. Um, another thing is, uh, you know, the authority of delegation job design. So we really sometimes need to restrict what people can do. Okay, so let me now apply some of these broad concepts to more special applications. Um, so one type of application is um, communities. And there's been one branch of recent literature, which some people here participated in, like Eric Budish and um, Josh Ganza, Neil Gandel, and others, um, basically trying to use, and, and I actually Hal Varian talked about it in his Eli lecture, of course, very forward looking, that in a world where you have much more measurability, and you also have the ability to implement contracts and software, you can create commitment and you can design organizations and communities to execute your contracts. And in principle, at large scale, they can make use of a lot of publicly available data as long as it's sort of verifiable and you agree on the source. So, you know, funding public goods, governing a developer community, you know, running a blockchain, um, managing and monetizing data privacy alternatives to current data markets, like with cookies and things like that, um, creator communities, virtual economies, these are all environments where in principle, um, contracts and incentives can be encoded in software and executed. So there's a few, I mean, there's a lot of attention to this, like in things like proof of stake and blockchain, it's like obviously gotten a lot of attention for obvious reasons, but that as a theoretical problem, Actually, th this is a much broader problem, and I, I would encourage people to, to think about that and think about other applications to that. Um, and Glenn Weil has, has done a lot of talking about this as well. Part of that, part of making that work is deciding what data are you taking in? So if I wanna write a smart contract based on stock prices, where well, we can agree to get a feed from Bloomberg. If I wanna write a contract based on, you know, votes people make in some blockchain thing, I know what to do. But if I wanted to instead like write contracts based on more complicated outcomes, like constructed measures or like noisy measures of some kind of performance, that gets a lot messier. And so I also think there's like an information design component to this. We have contracts and software that can take digital input, but what's the right input to give them? And how can we verify it and agree on it? Suppose we wanted to monitor a social media company's content moderation or something, you know, how would we take some verifiable data and put it into that? So we have some, some students at Stanford who, who have been thinking about this. There's companies that are thinking about this. It's a kind of an, an interesting area. Um, another kind of more focused area is like things like, um, you know, uh, uh, Com communities like open source software communities um it's got a little bit less of this software contracts but it's more constitutions and institutions um it, these institutions can decide things like hierarchy and status like you're a pro reviewer or if you're in a software developer open source community the people there can be voting and rules about who gets to commit and who doesn't so a long time ago, Glenn Ellison and I wrote a paper about this. There's actually a big multidisciplinary literature about this. I also worked on um, endogenous hierarchies and reputations from a, from a repeated games theory. Um, there's some recent empirical work about these communities on stack overflow and how they work. So I think there's a really not fully developed theory about these like self-organizing communities and how they govern themselves to solve the kinds of things we're worried about, content moderation issues, spamming issues, um, and so on. And incentive issues. One of, Glenn and I talked a lot about incentive issues as well. Another branch is designing voting institutions. So various folks, some folks, several people at Stanford are interested in um, coming up with methods to aggregate people's preferences by voting over public goods. 
Um, Geloff and Goel have things where they, you get representatives who are incentivized to invest in information. Um, other people are looking at things like, could, how could a social media platform get people to vote on its content moderation policy? There, you're going to have to trust the platform to implement it. So the platform is the market designer, but it still needs to have some credibility. And even if you want to do that, like, what do you vote on? What are you measuring exactly? Like, what does it mean to vote for Facebook to have a more strict content moderation policy? That's a, it's a, that's a tricky thing. And we also saw Mastodon kind of has this decentralized setting where each server has its own content moderation policies and they compete in content moderation. So I think it's a given this, we have this regulatory problem about content moderation, which is very difficult to solve. Market designers maybe should think outside the box instead of, instead of just kind of yelling at the firms for their all the bad things they're doing, which is probably a, a useful activity. But there's another, another useful activity, which is to think about constructive solutions. And there, I think I'm just pointing out that I think they're, they're theoretically rich. Another area that I think has all very poorly developed theory and is incredibly important in practice. And actually, this is one where even the firms are don't understand that very well internally, partly because they don't have a good theoretical framework, is um, managing participants on a platform. So it's a platform regulating itself, regulating its own users. And here I'm going to abstract from conflicts of interest. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to think about the platform versus society. I'm just going to think about what the platform does internally. And again, we can take some inspiration from what they figured out, but there's also, I, I'm, I'm telling you that they have not figured it out. In fact, if anybody wants to, there's like a huge army of firms that would love to have economic consultants help them figure it out because they're calling me all the time and I'm telling them that I am not interested. Um, but uh, but they're, they, they have a lot of problems. So um, recommendation system, first of all, a, a, one key point that, most engineers don't get and most people didn't get until relatively recently, but it, it's something that I kind of obsessed on um, from the first day. And I think the, the economists who were deep in this saw this right away, is that recommendation systems are incentive systems. So engineers think about a recommendation system as like a thing to maximize user experience. And so I'm going to maximize clicks. But how many clicks a supplier gets is everything. It changes their incentives. If they get more clicks because they do X, they're going to do more of X. Okay. So recommendation systems, it's very simple things. A recommendation system that gives all the, the clicks to big, big suppliers or big creators is going to make it not very easy for small creators to come into a system. And that's going to be bad for the system in the long run. Um, and they have lots of tools. It's not just the recommendation system, it's the content moderation, it's how prominent things are, it's the interface design, it's how you search. All of those things are incentive systems. And actually some of my Stanford colleagues wrote a paper on eBay talking about how when they changed the way that search worked, you know, it changed prices because it made them the things that were substitutes more obviously substitutes. That's a very simple example, but there's much more complicated examples. You know, if I change, if I make my content moderation more fair, that might lead to more fake news getting created, for example. So how you moderate affects what's created. And especially now that we have robots spanning the system with fake news or fake posts or manipulative posts, then you really have to think about, you know, you could be fair today, but generate a supply that an equilibrium supply that is much more important. And this theme that like a mechanism design is much more important for entry than it is for behavior conditional on entry is something that John Levin and I and Enrique Serra fleshed out in a series of papers about timber auctions, very old school. Um, but that same theme that thinking more about market design's impact on participation than on the short run outcomes, the short run outcomes feed into the long run outcomes, but the impact of the long run outcomes can be greater. Um, engagement incentives. So what is it we want people to do? Why do these incentives matter so much? You want your Airbnb person to confirm your reservation. You don't want them to not cancel on you. You want your dog walker to show up on time. You want people to ship what they say they're going to ship. You want their pictures to be accurate. There are all sorts of things you want people to do in a marketplace or a platform. And if they have no, if they don't do a lot of business with your platform, they don't care. If they don't do enough business, then taking their business away doesn't give you a very big stick. So if you want a platform to work, 
you would rather have a medium number of people who provide good service than a whole bunch of people who are all getting crumbs and none of them care enough to even check their email or check their texts or no, check their notifications. So managing that is really tricky. And I wrote this little pyramid, this design problem, it's an optimization problem. As far as I know, I, there's zero models of this, although somebody may find me one in the operations literature, but I've been saying this for like 15 years and I still don't think anybody's actually written this down fully is like just how do you optimize like the new users versus the older users in an environment where you're 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 facing trade-offs the power users might provide better service um the medium users provide more diversity more reliability they help you in surges when things get busy um but if you have too many users they not, nobody cares and they give bad service so it's a set of trade-offs maybe it's just that's too simple an optimization problem that's why nobody writes it down um but I think there are pieces of it you could bite off that would be interesting. Um, another related element that's more getting bigger now with all of these creator communities and metaverses and games is like, how do you design social groups? And actually, I missed the bullet point, but also how do you design the virtual economies? Um, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, creators like lots of followers, followers like having engagement from the creators. But if there's lots of followers, then the creator isn't going to pay attention to you. They won't respond to your messages. So, you know, there's like an optimal design of a community that gets incentives for, for both creators and participants. Um, this also gets complicated if the participants are also creators or if the participants become creators. Um, there was this eBay case study um, where eBay cut listing fees for sellers. That led more sellers to come that made them some money. But then the sellers bought stuff when they came to eBay and the impact of the sellers, the sellers buying more stuff on eBay was even bigger than the direct effect. And of course, Greg Lewis's thesis talked about the impact of pictures on trust and things like that. So this idea that like we, we are, we, we, we shape the institutions that engenders the participation, which then, you know, making pictures, Greg's paper showed that when it, pictures got easier to download, people put up more pictures that led to more transactions. These like feedback effects of institutions and fees on equilibrium participation are important. Fairness and efficiency. So like um, Mike Luca and co-authors, um, Ben Edelman, they have a, this paper on showing that in Airbnb, when you show profile pictures, it gets discrimination. But we also know the pictures engender trust and make people behave better. Um, I have a recent paper where we measure preferences um, on for demographic characteristics on the Kiva social giving platform, and we do counterfactuals about how you um, trade off efficiency and fairness. Um, when we do that, one of the counterfactuals we do is more of an outside the box one, where instead of just so in this case, like women smile more and people like to give to women, and so if you build a recommendation system, it will promote smiles and will also promote women and then men will get less loans. Um, the but if we just got everybody to smile, um, that would alleviate some of the trade offs. So some of these outside the box things trying to guide people in their creation instead of just taking it as fixed can be helpful. Another theme that's really interesting from a design perspective is ensuring quality through screening, monitoring and reputation. Um, Camilla Castillo, uh, together with a graduate student, Bharat Chandar and I have a paper about monitoring Uber drivers. And we show that when they monitor the Uber drivers and give them in a randomized experiment, give them information about their performance, the bad performing drivers perform better. And so we, um, this is just an example where digitization, like Hal said in his Eli lecture, um, enables monitoring um, and that, and just giving the information and shaping people's behavior through the information can lead to better outcomes. It also suggests something bigger picture about, you know, again, screening versus monitoring when, when you have digitization. Okay, let me um, actually, I want to say one or two things. I'm, I'm a little short on time, but let, so I'm going to talk a little fast. I want to make an analogy between uh, data-driven tech firms and also regulating AI. And I, I understand actually, I thought the next session was gonna talk about um, AI alignment and I think they're not gonna talk about it too much. So I'm gonna give a little hook to that too, because that's also an incentive problem. So first of all, a data-driven tech firm, big picture, they have a whole bunch of teams. Those teams, you can change this feature and this feature and this feature. Their little algorithm, like classifying whether something's a Wikipedia entry, 
interacts with the rest of a system through an API, or at least this is the way it used to be in, in a lot of them. Um, who knows how ChatGPT changes that? You have an A-B testing platform that does randomized experiments and says algorithm A is better than algorithm B. In one meeting, you might make 100 decisions about shipping products. Okay, so you it's it's it's, it's so even though you're inside a firm, you've you've implemented this like arm's length decision making process where specific measures determine what's shipped. The big problem with that is then those are short term measures like clicks, and so then the firm ends up you know putting up clickbait and spam and all sorts of other bad things. So the firms still today do that, first of all, because it's the second best problem and clicks are easy to measure. So they still do that. That's why you see so much of this crap. But over time, they would also put in additional tactics that help them do better. Like they might say, there's certain things you're just not allowed to do. I don't care what it does with the API, because my theory is that has long-term effects that aren't measurable. Some things I've worked on are designing different experiments for things that have long-term effects. Putting in peer review. There's a whole bunch of things you can do that try to govern the system in an environment where you can't measure what you care about. And I always took a lot of inspiration from Paul and, and Bink's work in trying to make these recommendations because, again, if you can't measure it, you've got to do something. You don't want just want to destroy society by radicalizing everybody because you can't measure. There must be something else you can do. And we try to try to do those things. Um, regulating algorithms. Um, it's very interesting. AI alignment and safety alignment and safety is a huge multidisciplinary literature. A few people, um, Jillian Hadfeld and, and co-authors, and I have a paper like this also, have tried to apply contract theory to the problem of motivating AI. Um, Hadfield used incomplete contracting theory. Um, I built on Agion and Tyrol. And so one of a lot of insights that we have from agency theory apply. Now, our AI is not risk averse, but we still have to give it an objective. That's the big thing. So the, the paper that, that I wrote was about authority, but built on Aguilon Troll. It was about what happens when you have AIs and people fall asleep at the wheel. So these are two images. If you search on Google Images, you can find like 100 images of people sleeping on while their Tesla is driving. Um, and so this is like autopilot makes you fall asleep at the wheel. We have a theory for that. Aguilon Troll says, if you're not the one making the decision, you put less effort into acquiring information. So I may may want to let the AI give you signals, but make you have the final decision, and that will motivate you to pay more attention. Um, so this is basically a framework you can, where you, an example, I just, an, hopefully an inspirational example of, we have these problems, but we actually have a lot of theory that gets us started, but the problems are a little bit different. So I think there's just lots to be done theoretically in in using contract theory and the tools we have already um, to analyze these regulation problems. Thank you.